Schindler has a chance to write his name in Huddersfield Town legend. And he takes that chance! Welcome to episode 6 of the Andy Takes That Chance podcast. Feeling refreshed after the international break, we have Neil, Danny, Cossie and myself, Matt. Welcome, guys. Good evening. Hello. Hi there. So how have you guys been spending your international break? Um, mostly emptying a new salon of rubbish and making numerous trips to it. Your hair's looking pretty good today. I didn't get it done there. <laughs> The chance for a plug there as well. <laughs> okay, so the international break, people tend to either love or hate international football. They either find it incredibly dull or some people get really patriotic, start waving flags around. I'm a little bit in between. I do like England. I do like watching England. I find it difficult if it's a friendly to remain interested. How about you guys? How, how do you feel about international football? Does it get in the way of a good season? Does it stop you from being on a roll? Or, or is it a welcome break when things aren't going well? I went to Halifax Town because I don't have Sky, so I don't I don't miss the uh, the international football. I just miss football, so I had to do something. It bores me daft. I've uh, I love the tournaments with the World Cups, Euros, things like that. I like watching the qualifiers for those, but when it comes to friendlies in this <clears throat> Nations League, I'm not remotely interested. I don't watch a minute of it. This Nations League is an incredibly convoluted exercise once once you have a look at it and understand it it looks all right it's better than a friendly so i watched the england spain game and what stood out mostly was that in the last 15 minutes usually there's been eight or nine subs and people just play it out but england were actually going to win this game with 15 minutes left and for me that was quite a nice change of pace from uh, friendlies which i find pointless as well to be honest and i did actually take in france versus holland for the first 45 minutes i think you did as well uh, Corsi. And one thing that stood out to me was that Holland looked pretty nice and neat in possession, but there was a bit of a, a void at left centre back where Daly Blint was was uh, struggling to uh, cope with uh, anybody really. Um, knowing what you do of international football, a chance for, or should Congolo be in there? Don't know enough about Ronald Koeman's uh, kind of thoughts really on Congolo. I think. I had an interview with him after the Everton game uh, on BBC Leeds and I think they Oggy put it to him, you know, getting in the national team and I think just give the stock answer, really got to work hard and, and make sure my performances, you know, catch his eye. So let's hope he can continue where he's been, you know, left off and you're brilliant at Everton. But yeah, international football, not not great. But... Just to finish the point in international football, it was nice to see uh, Wakefield's own Matthias Zanka Jorgensen cementing his place in the Denmark team as well and they, they took victory against Wales, which was good. So, international football out of the way. And Neil's all of a sudden back in the room now. We're, we're do, doing away with that. And we've got Crystal Palace this Saturday. We've had a little bit of news today. Apparently, Zaha's back in training, uh, ready. Probably won't be 100%. But Bring him on just in time to get kicked again to death, like we apparently did last season. I'll take him on in the tunnel. We've got previous. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the when we went there first game of last season again? It's probably the best, probably the best away day last season. Turning up at Palace three 0 Munier's header was a, a thing of beauty, really a classic centre forwards header. And one of the things that amused me afterwards was, as Costa you were saying off air just beforehand, in that in the Premier League you'll find that you get absolutely zero credit when you turn in a decent performance if you're little old Huddersfield Town a, a tag which rankles me a little bit. Because it's wrong. It is. And one thing that was quite amusing after that was the somebody decided to watch 90 minutes of footage and put together two minutes worth of fouls, apparently fouls on Wilfred Zaha. Are we, are we hoping for something else if he does play? I, I hope we get another compilation from the same weapon that did the last one, to be honest. Just, um, it's, well, what a whopper. Right, Neil. So we're definitely hoping for a bit of Twitter weaponry this uh, this coming weekend. That points to a good sign. So how would you approach this this coming weekend? So bearing in mind some of the stats that we dredged out a couple of weeks ago with regards to 
how we line up at home in that four two three one, and it's something like one goal in seven games. Would you switch it after we looked quite quite good in a back three slash five against Everton, or do you take the bull by the horns because it's a home game there's, and and really sort of go at them in a in a different way? I think there's two ways to look at it. I think the, the four two three one, as, as we discussed before um, last week, week before, has yielded one goal from what seven eight home games. So that something's got to change there. And looking at the Everton game, yeah, we set up supposedly defensively, but actually looked more threatening than we have done for a long time up front, which, you know, six shots on target or six attempts on target overall caused Everton a lot of problems. So I'd be I'd be very, very tempted to leave it the same. I'd just maybe like to see a change of the odd person in the in the eleven. So speaking about that, so... In particular, one player, one player that stood stood out quite well was Eric Doom against um, against Leighton Baines. Sort of late on in the game, he he beat him all ends up. He looked he looked pretty sharp, and they've they've been playing a, an intra squad friendly during um, the international break, where I believe he got ninety minutes as well. So, do you think now it's time to time to go Derm, or do you maybe look at Smith or Flo still and give them another go? He's an absolute showing for me. He showed enough in. The 70 odd minutes at Stoke, the 15 20 minutes at Everton, and I think now with obviously another two weeks training on the top of that, the behind closed doors, friendly between squad, and he starts for me. No brainer, he is going to be one of our best players, so let's just get him in there now. Right or left back, though? Right on side for me, right side back four, yeah. Okay, um, Jonathan Hogg still suspended. Do you do you keep faith with uh, Phil Billing as well? Hundred percent, yeah, he's earned his place. Hmm? I thought Phil was was really good. It was it was surprising to see a couple of people having a pop after the Everton game, or maybe it wasn't surprising because in some it, it's not surprising. It's quite that's, sad though. It's yeah. a bit of a you know they can't have watched the game, and if if they have watched the game, it's clearly an agenda against Billing rather than his ability because it was it it was a, a very close call between Billing and, and the other one that fans love to mock. Van La Parra, they were the two mm. outstanding players at Everton. I can't believe I heard that. That's people knocking Billy. I thought maybe even his best appearance in a town shirt, maybe that appearance at, against Manchester City in the Cup, the other one I can remember off the top of my head. But it was brilliant. You've got to remember the booking that he got. Uh, you know, he had to show massive discipline. So he had to do things that we'd not seen before. That, my first thought was, Oof, do you, you know, do you sub him off? He was brilliant. And to me, it's not a matter of, uh, you know, if you drop him, he's one of the first names on the sheet. So I think that the heartwarming thing from the the Everton game, guys, was in particular was it was despite a back five and despite defending deep for for parts of it, we, we were back on the front foot again rather than defending on the back foot. And I think that's really just what the majority of fans want to see against Crystal Palace is another performance whereby we're on the front foot, we have a go at Crystal Palace, not not you know cavalier style throwing men forward at every every opportunity, but within reason get forward. You know, put men in the box and and actually look to have a go and take the game because when we played them back in uh, March April, we we kind of withered a little bit in in a poor two nil game and what we're really looking to avoid is going down the same route whereby we pigeonhole ourselves into one specific attacking move and Crystal Palace have got pace all over the pitch and pace obviously hurts us through the middle out wide and I think we just need to be a little bit braver and. You know, in possession and with the runs that we make, and to trust some of the players a little bit more when they do make the runs. And in that, if we do get countered, we need to measure against that. But it's it's really important, in especially in a home game, to really get people in the right position and go for it. I think it could be quite a game. Probably going to jinx it now for a nil nil. But just having a look at the last two games, Palace have set up away from home. You've got Townsend and Schlup on the the wings. Zaha, so whether he's going to be in or not, I don't know. But you've got Benteke and Ayu, who caused us quite a few problems. I remember last season when we were playing Swansea. So I think they'll be, they're will be they a dangerous team. I look at the back. Obviously, we've got Martin Kelly coming back. But I think they're gettable at the back, don't rate Van Aron, at the, you know, as full-back or Ward. So I do I do think we can get at them. But the big question is, I think, are we going to be brave? Are we going to learn from last season where I thought they blitzed us? I thought they were really aggressive. I thought they came at us and... I didn't think we had an answer to be honest. They overpowered us, and looking the way they're setting up, I'd be surprised if they do anything different, really, in that as well. So for me, it's more about us. Are we going to? I'm just hoping we're not going to just retreat and kind of play one of these, you know, kind of cagey games as well, because you want to build on what we saw at Everton. I, I think we've got to be brave. 
we're at home. It's it's a chance to get some points, and not a point, some points. You know, we've got to be looking at this game as a as a very very winnable game for me. And you've got to add in Derm improves us from last season. You've got to hope that the wide lads are going to improve us from last season. Dick Carve did all right at Everton, to be fair. Um, obviously, Van La Parra has stepped up again, gone up another level for me already this season from what he was last season. That's you know people saying he, he, he should be shipped out. This had an other for new lads, but if the new lads are going to be coming in and pushing the lads that have already got on rather than replacing, that can only be good. So, I think the only worry with Dear Carby for me, and again, you want you want to kind of play on his positive strengths, but he doesn't give you much when he's lost the ball. Neil, I know you'll say, well, that that's not his job, but I think a David Wagner kind of winger needs to give a bit more. That's why I think he really likes Van La Parra, the way he kind of he's brought this education, this defensive side of his game, and I noticed on I think you know for the goal that they scored, if I could be wrong, that I think Dear Carby, you know, kind of was a bit short, but. It is, it is going to be an interesting game. It could be a bit of a shootout. This. I'm optimistic that we're going to see a few goals on Saturday. So if it's nil-nil, blame me. It is nailed on goal just now. I think one one thing is that this next run of four that we've got, we've got Crystal Palace, obviously, Saturday, and then the week after, Leicester away, Spurs at home, and then Burnley away. The, the, the four games whereby you look at them and you think, Palace, we could win. Leicester City, if they're not on it, we could turn up and get something there. Spurs, you, you tend not to think you can get something, but it's not impossible. And then Burnley aren't in the best form either. I think this is a little bit of a period whereby it really sort of sets out where we are this season because I, I look at that and I think we could potentially get we could potentially get 9 out of 12 in, in many ways, but we could also potentially get not out of 12. So I think this is a, a not a critical period, but I think this is a really, really good small little period which will tell us where we are and how we've progressed. That, that's this league though you, you can you can get turned over by literally everybody you got to fight for every for every point for every win Watford have shown the other week that Tottenham can be got at can be beaten um, we know we've got well let, let's be fair Tottenham last season murdered us at our place and murdered us 2 at, at Wembley as well in the, in the uh, return game I think we've just got to go out there against these teams a bit more confidence I think, I think that's I think what that's we're lacking it. last season against so Osai, just confidence. Yeah, I think, and come to you a sec, Danny, but I think it's a good point in that we, we need to stop looking at Leicester away and thinking, oh, no, we're not going to get anything there. We need to put everything. I think the what we did with the Cardiff game is we, we looked at the first couple of games and thought, do you know what, we write these off, we're not going to get anything. And then we put too much emphasis on Cardiff and we froze a little bit. And I think these next four games are a really good point in that we can get things here. And if we do get things, I think it sets us up nicely. Yeah, going back to Palace, and uh, when we were on the way back from Everton listening to 606, a couple of Palace fans phoned up, and it, it was really negative from them. I know they'd lost Zaha, but they were sort of saying, well, even with Zaha, we, we, were, we still would have struggled in that game. So I think if they were angry after that match, if they get beaten by town, you can see them being on a real downer, which is only good for us if they're going to be down there alongside us. Um, so I think if we can get some... I mean. Even if we even just got a point against them, I would see their fans reacting badly to it. They're expecting a win again. I think what's interesting for me is <clears throat> when he heard Wagner's interview after Everton, he was clear that you know he'd done his homework on Marco Silva's in- his interview was really interesting when he was saying set pieces, you know, targeting on that. It's obviously you know he d- he look- looked into what they did and got their Achilles heel. I thought he got the tactical battle right over Silva and yeah, we had some of the morning Everton fans as usual. It's because, you know, we were off, off colour but I thought a lot of it was down to us. This is going to be interesting because Rodson's a, a kind of wily old fox really and that as well and I, I think they'll come positive Palace. I'll be amazed, you know, kind of after seeing their lineups whether they're going to do anything but so I think I think so. the emphasis is all about us. My only regret about this game is that it wasn't last week. I, I just everybody felt like a win leaving Goodison Everyone was buzzing, and you know, obviously, we have to stop for the internationals. It's just a shame. Can we kind of bring what we had coming out of Goodison on that Saturday, when it did feel like a win? Can we bring that to the, you know, to the stadium on Saturday at five to three? That's the question for me. Pal- Palace will come to win. There's absolutely no doubt about it. I don't think they'll set up any other way. I think against the, the better sides, they probably will. But they'll they'll see this as a as a as a great chance to go away and, and get a win. Um, they, they murdered us last season at our place. To be fair, absolutely murdered us. Question I want to ask you guys, and is this a VAR game? It is, yeah, but but is it is it the VAR as we saw it in the World Cup or as we've seen it in the Spanish league, or is it just a trial behind closed doors? So we're not going to kind of see what 
they all singing and dancing what we saw. I believe what what they're doing is they're trialing VAR, but VAR decisions won't be made right. on the day. So essentially, it'll be it's a test run behind the scenes, but we won't see anything. Excellent. My mum uh, obviously got it wrong. If you're listening, mum. <clears throat> so just to finish the the Crystal Palace segment here. Um, what do you fancy? I'm going to go to you first, Neil, because you seem the most reluctant, so we'll get the most honest answer, I think. Uh, what do you fancy for this Saturday, score uh, result-wise? It's it's a very, very difficult game. I think anybody turning up expecting an easy home win is going to be in for a bit of an awakening. Palace are a decent side. They've got some good players. I'm just hoping that the additions that we've made, I want Derby in the side and the additions that we have made and the lads who have stepped up another level Van La Parra billing let's hope that we can turn what I'm guessing might be a draw into a win I'll just be happy as long as we upset a few Palace fans again I'm calling a magnificent three to win for town and hopefully in the style of a Blackpool Bradford City game uh, if we can have that please so for me it, it depends on a few things so um, Crystal Palace's mindset just before the international break Crystal Palace looked a little bit bereft, but they've had a bit of a chance to recharge. They've got Zaha back in training. I think if the, if Zaha turns up and plays well and and they're on it, I, I think we lose. But if they do some good shin pads, yeah. But if they don't and Crystal Palace aren't at it, I think we beat them. So I think it depends on the key player. So if Zaha, for example, doesn't play, I think we've got a great chance of taking all three. All I want to finish this one off is I'm highly delighted if that weapon returns with another. Montage. Video, another montage of Zaha hits. Contact, that's what it's highlighting, isn't it? Contact. He wasn't even saying foul, he was just sort of stopping the play in the video and, and writing contact in big red letters I on the thing. I actually sent him a video clip back, and I've got it on my phone, of Zaha running back and taking Tommy Smith out. I know that's not mention that one. The thing is, though, one, one thing that seems to be lost, and I, for me it's a, an influx of professional footballers or ex-professional footballers into the media who... This is bit strong but they for me normalize cheating in terms that contact is not a foul that it's not in the laws that contact is a foul football is or was a contact sport if you shoulder if you just run alongside someone and there's a nudge it's not a foul and i think that's the the, the thing for me which grinds a little bit is that it's gone soft it is that but contact does not mean foul you know what annoys me as well is that Coming from Palace, they provided us with one of our most dirty players that I've ever seen. We'll play it to later in the programme, but there seems to be a bit of a sort of model outrage from some of them that they don't do anything bad. And Crystal Palace last season actually had the most fouls and bookings in the Premier League. And the last time we played them at their place before we got promoted, they had uh, another ex-Tam Loney sent off for a shocking challenge, Damien Delaney. Do you remember when he played and he actually played on the left wing away at Notts County? And he was left. garbage. I remember him taking a free kick at Wrexham, stumbling, falling over and kicking it just slightly with his foot and that's the worst free kick I've ever seen from town. <laughs> <laughs> so we're feeling that if we... I think we're all quite ad, uh, we're all quite adamant that if we turn up and we're, we're on the front foot, Palace maybe not 100%, then we can do this. So moving on from Crystal Palace, one other thing that was in the news this week and released by the club was that... Huddersfield Town are to redevelop Canal Side. It's drawn a mixed bag of opinion from here and there. Things ranging from social media and forums, from what's happening with the community, the community, the initial members of Syngenta, all the way through to why does that building look so ugly like a school? Um, between fifteen and twenty million pounds are going on onto the complex, and and the main thing. Cosy, that we can see is that the the community is going to move down to Leeds Road Sports Complex, which will probably take another couple of years to to redevelop. After that, there's going to be three stories. There's going to be a hydrotherapy room, and it's going to be a players only function. Uh, they haven't mentioned yet as to whether the parking that I think it's seventy five pounds a year is it for parking there at the minute. They haven't mentioned whether that will still uh, maintain or whether that will be moving on as well. Um, what what do you guys think when you, when you see these plans and you go on the, the Doom style walkthrough, Danny? I think it's great, but then, to be honest, I don't use Canal Side at the moment, so none of the negatives that some people are highlighting affect me, and I sort of look at it and think, well, 
we've got to look at the bigger picture here and what we need is something like that to compete with clubs at this level and at the championship we, we need something that's better than what we've got at the moment because if you look back people uh, that we've had at the club uh, at, at that sort of at the training level have said our facilities just aren't good enough for where for where we were back in the championship let alone where we are now so all positive for me it's investing in the future and De- Dean Oyle is, is leaving a legacy however long he'll be around at Huddersfield Town um, we don't know hopefully he'll have a long time to come but he's doing the one thing that he said he wanted to do and he's, he's leaving a sound foundation of a football club from the let's be fair the shambolic job that he took over he's done an amazing job so one thing when we look at other clubs um, is that chairman come chairman go chairman leave no form of of legacy um, but when Dean Hoyle decides he's had enough and he wants to go sit back in the stands, we, we look at we, we mentioned Bradford City a few times, haven't we? When they got to the Premier League, they spent a couple of years here, threw all the money on players, and ended up having Flamingo Land on their ground and and whatnot, and training at a school. What we've got here, which is really good to see, is that we, we've done Canal Side Mark One, Canal Side Mark Two is coming in, um, and what this should do is it should give us Premier League facilities now and into the future, no matter what should happen to the football club. And that's something that will help players improve. It's something that will attract players to come in the first place. And it also sticks two fingers up at Stuart Webber, who said he went to Norwich because they had more cryo chambers than what we did. Norwich, uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to Lee Bromby, and he was on loan at Norwich, and I went to their training ground when he signed. And it's, oh, compared to ours, it's chalk and cheese. So this news is, you know, been long overdue. I'm kind of a little bit worried that, you know, obviously we hope we stay in the Premier League this year, but if we did go, what what would be kind of a legacy or a reminder, really? Just a few porter cabins dotted about, you know, selling shirts. But this is brilliant news. Uh, I was one of the kind of founder members, Canal Side, back in the day, you know, when when we kind of moved in there. And let's be honest, we was very lucky to have the access that we did. Uh, You know, I could never believe it. We were like, you know, rubbing past players and things and... No, I've always felt that, you know, we've, as fans, we've been out staying out, kind of welcoming Canal Side. I think the, the gym was had seen better days. Obviously, people went there for the lunches and, yeah, the, the fan park in you know, the last few years has, has been good. But really, you know, that now when you're getting signing players, you're not being in the stadium, you know, was it 19 times a season? Players are going to come and see them facilities and that's going to be a massive influence on whether they sign or not. And yeah, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, incredible outlay. I think what I find interesting on the statement that was you know, kind of laid, it was it was mentioning about that the money had come from Dean Hall and the board of directors. So I think one thing that's interesting, Cosy, is that on the plans, it looks like we've purchased land from Hoyer as well, who's next door. So there's another pitch going in where the right at the back of the car park and it's all grassy. Yeah, like a, a little yeah. stand in it, and... and and one thing I like, and a lot of people looked at the design and, and kind of went, "Oh, it's ugly." Apparently, the the corner is a uh, a nod to um, is it Victoria Tower? The uh... yeah, I'd, Matt, you'll you'll have probably been at Thorpe Arch. You know, dare I mention them them kind of words? The Legion at a training ground. I've been a few times, you know, to see games and. And the facilities there, it's just totally different. I know they were built when, you know, kind of Leeds had a, t- had a team, but ours are so behind the times. I don't think people get how far they are behind the times. And yeah, we, there was a bit of a development a few years ago. But even then, I, I mean, I, I went to uh, the fan park for the first game of the season and I felt Canal Side looked a bit stale and old, to be honest with you. And I felt bad saying that because I'm thinking, wow, it only just, it wasn't too long ago since it was done up. So long overdue. Obviously, it's going to be some massive work that will be taking place and a lot of people are. You know, where's the car parking going to be? You know, where we're going to meet before the game? But I think, like you were saying earlier on, it, I think people got to look bigger picture. It's, it's, it's brilliant. And yeah, the design, you know, it doesn't really matter, does it? We're not going to be in it, really, unless we become staff members and, and things. So to me, it's all positive. But as you know, with town fans, if they can find a negative in it, then you know, we're hearing it. But some of the stuff, I mean, it's very minor gripes, really, Neil. I just think it's a, it's a great bit of news and... You know, 15 to 20 million, just think about that. It's just incredible for it's, us. It's classic town fan syndrome, let's be fair. There's there's a lot of mourning sods who go watch town who will mourn regardless. And where we are at the moment, the, these are the days. Everyone used, everyone used to sing the song, those were the days. We're now living them. This is it. This is as good as it's ever been for any of us and for probably any town in, in any town fan in living memory. And we've got a chairman now 
who's building a legacy to make sure that this club is sustainable for a lot longer after we've all gone. Do you think, I'm just kind of moving it on a little bit, but do you think the kind of the interest is, is winning a little bit, Neil? Pardon your second name there, but we're not, we didn't sell out for everyone. We didn't sell out for Man City. We're seeing, you know, Crystal Palace, you know, booking, you don't have to have a previous booking history and things. And I suppose Burnley will get to, you know, similar points. What 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 is it? Do people, we've said give us one season. Is, is that it? Is it just because we haven't won a game? I, I'm kind of sensing that. The appetite is not what it was, and it makes me sad, really. Why is it? I agree. I agree with everything you've said. I think the fixtures have maybe gone against us a little bit, starting with Man City and Chelsea and getting to wallopings. Um, Would it have been different if we'd have started off with Southampton at home and uh, Newcastle away instead, or who who knows? But there's definitely a little sense of apathy um, and. I'll be honest, I think a win on Saturday could change a lot of that and change the emphasis on people's mindset and what have you. I mean, look at last week, we all came out of Everton buzzing. So I think that's essentially, I think what's caused the apathy is probably the level of performance and the lack of a sight, lack of excitement. And it's we're having like one or two shots on target a game and I think people just aren't finding it entertaining and I think that's probably the main driver behind it. I think it just needs one or two decent games where people feel they've got full value, do you know, when they've seen... I know most of the time it is full value. It's Premier League football. We've seen some great players. But I think people just want a little bit of the entertainment factor back. Um, and I think once it does, I think it, it was so against Everton, it's coming. And I think once it does, I think everyone will be back on board. It, it's a shame the Everton performance wasn't at home. Mm. Because I think that would have sort of sparked a few more into life. But the, mm. to get a performance like that against a team who've spent probably nigh on 250, 300 million in the last two summers. Mm. I think to go away and perform and probably come away a bit spot we've not won, that's a great start for this season now for me. And it's it's it's, how it's a chance now to build on that. And it's up to the fans. We've got a chairman who's giving everything. He is giving everything. And it's up to us now as fans, and to, well, to, just to back him and back the club. It's That's the least he deserves. And it's, we've got the easy bit, let's be fair. Yeah, I think you had to watch the 90 minutes of Everton. I think sometimes you can see match of the day and condensing some highlights and Everton now have us having the ball and stuff switching across the box. I felt we were pretty comfortable, to be honest, all afternoon. And yeah, you know, if anyone were going to win it, we did. But yeah, there's so much to be positive about. But I just hope that we can take that in, you know, to Saturday and that the international break has not kind of, you know, put a bit of a dampener on it, really. One of one of the frustrations a couple of my mates had, I, I tend not to watch match of the day because it's, borrow a phrase from you, Neil, it's full of weapons. So completely, D- Danny. Mur- if Danny Murphy's there, you know the TV's out the window. I, I can't, I can't cope. But what what people have said from watching goals on Sunday and watching match of the day, we had six shots on. Ta- well, shots is probably loose, but we had six attempts on target, and the only shot or the only chance that showed Huddersfield going forward in the entire highlights package of everything was, was the goal. goal. I'm going to go against you here because <laughs> I, I was there. I enjoyed it, but I think when you look at those chances we had. I was sort of thinking, that, I mean, there were sort of almost chances where Mounier goes through and should have got a shot away better, but you can't show that on TV because it's not entertaining TV. And I think this goes back to what, what we were discussing earlier. We're the sort of hardcore who will always be there, League One, Championship, League Two, whatever. But I can understand that some sort of the newcomers who are there just because we are in the Premier League and there are people there who just won't be enjoying what we're playing at the moment. As Our home record, as we've said, is really poor over the past seven games or so. So I get it that, that that people are enthused at the moment. We will always be there. And it's it's just I think it's a bit easy to say that people should be just turning up no matter what because the football's not being great. I do think it's kind of you know you are getting your fan bases you know Sunderland and what have you they'll come through thick and thin. But I do think town fans traditionally I hope I'm not, maybe speaking out. I do think it's based on on results. A number of times but I remember at Leeds Road we you know. This was the game we had everyone in and we lost. And then the next game, you know, there was kind of half the crowd and stuff like that as well. We are, I don't think we're as kind of, you know, fanatical, shall I say, as, as some other, you know, teams. And when I, when I kind of, yeah, when I see like Derby getting some of their crowds and, you know, they're, they're still missing out on getting back in the <laughs> Premier League. But yeah, I, it's a good point that I think, yeah, maybe it is, you know, because until, you know, recently it hasn't, hasn't been much to shout about, but hopefully Saturday we can put it right with a win and a good performance. Just yes. to finish on, because you, you <coughs> had been to Thorpe Arch and stuff, and 
yes for my sins I've I've been there um, one thing I'll go back to a canal side I will stick up for it a little bit in that 2013 it did get voted the best training facility in the north of England ahead of Thorpe Arch uh, by the FA's EPPP system um, Leeds almost got relegated to category 3 like maybe they are things are looking tired and having um, little we used to call them terrapins when we were at school the, you know, the things outside having those around hasn't made it look great but I think the facilities there are generally pretty good I, I've been to Sheffield United Sheffield United's pretty good as well that's improved they've got, mm. it's almost like a factory that they've got there but the pictures Huddersfield's pictures are a lot better um, Bradford train at school yeah I drove past that last Saturday I could not believe it. it's the home of you know Bradford City it's training ground and was it a school in it Woodhouse Grove well, yeah, Woodhouse Grove it's absolutely we, incredible we've, I, when, when he was to manage Sunday Lake signs we've actually played uh, cup semi-finals on the two pitches joining to where uh, Bradford train that's the level they're at lads oh, I'd, I'd still love Saturday though Bradford and Blackpool I wish we could have a separate show for that I, what it beautiful I, that. I watched it for my sins I, oh. I was laid at home nothing to do put on the browser and what, what was what game I could get and the only <laughs> there were Bradford and Blackpool and I watched it in the second half 2 and up I'm thinking three goals at last six minutes I was just sat there laughing yeah. reminds me of that Makaliski game didn't it the yeah, infamous Scunthorpe and I, I've got to say I left at 2-0 and I regret it for a long time that was the Effie Sodgy game for me oh own goal yeah. gave away a penalty got sent off and got the champion of the League 2 Player of the Month award before <laughs> kick off brilliant uh, yeah Danny Schofield got sent off didn't he for diving oh, into the crowd on the third goal that was that was that was a great day, was that as well, because you missed a classic. Oh, I remember being at Canal Side, can I just sit in this chair and this woman drove up, she said, they're winning. I like, shut up. And like, put Radio Leeds on and back in the day when we were on FM, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. And uh, yeah, I'll give her going bananas. Uh, yeah, unbelievable. So I think that concludes this episode. Um, hopefully we get something from Crystal Palace thanks for listening and, and tune in a little bit later as well for a, a special an international break special that we've got coming up as well so again thanks for your support thank you for interacting getting in touch and we'll hear from you soon is this the moment for Lee Fowler it is take your place in Division 2 Huddersfield Town he's missed Steve Simonson clears the flame of the goal and collapses in a heap of tears. Pete's got a chance. Yes. Pete scores. Jack Pete scores. Heffel is in there. Smith scores for Northfield Town. 3 2 Town. For a sherry, Danny Ward saves! Danny Ward saves! The quack was in, round the hair! 2-0 on a field town! Christopher Schindler has a chance to write his name in Huddersfield Town legend. And he takes that chance!